Welcome to Evolution Hour. Clickety clack. Analog devices. I'm an old analog device. TortugaWordPress.com, the uh, website of my little project involved that has ballooned into books and uh, this program where we explore the exciting world of people who never fact check anything and muddle themselves up in a complete range, <laughs> getting into a Halloweeny mood, uh, given the time frame. And what could be scarier than titans of the earth, sea, and air from our creationists and the fact that the new speaker of the house is a answers in Genesis style creationist? <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> okay, well, well, well. Um, <clears throat> Continuing to plow through his chapter three, uh, their chapter three on the um, uh, speciation and natural selection issue and kinds, kind of, sort of. But it's really uh, a restatement of an awful lot of relatively uninformative creationist posts, virtually all funneled through that CMI filter. And the one that came up next uh, is one from Sir Hati and Bates, um, from 2020, fairly recent, in other words, at, at, at this time at least, uh, which contained a, a, a statement that really did jump right out at me. <clears throat> Many people hear about new species arising via natural selection. One famous example taught at many secular universities is how darker colored pepper moths allegedly arose due to the increase of air pollution after the Industrial Revolution. Okay, yeah, pepper moth, blah, blah, blah. No sources were given for it, by the way. Uh, but who the hell in the scientific community was claiming that this was a speciation event? Nobody. It's Biston area, whatever it is, uh, all the way down the road. It was the coloration of the moth changing over time that was showing the effect of natural selection on a natural population. No one was arguing that it was a speciation event. For that, you have a whole literature on speciation event. And so this kind of reinforces that tendency among creationists to be awfully squishy about what kind of thing do they mean by speciation and where is the boundary between that and actual living populations? And that kind of vagueness that the Sirhati piece has uh, feeds into a mindset because anybody that's uh, bumped into people online who are creationists will find lots and lots and lots of them who um, think that kinds are species, that a kind, ah, oh, hello, secular universities. Well, that's your red flag there. Yes, exa exactly. Um, that the um, grassroots creationist just imbibes this notion that speciation doesn't take place at all. And if they're tunnel vision and thinking in terms of human beings, it's relatively easy to think in that terms. And then they have the dogs reproducing after kinds and that way, and, and dogs are all the same species. Uh, so an awful lot of about that doesn't ever reinforce the idea that the creationist model, in fact, involves gigantic amount of speciation way above that species level, above the genus level, above the fam, up to the family level, uh, and maybe even a little bit higher, depending upon one of the circumstances of it. Uh, they're very, very vague and, and, and exasperating on that. I also love that use of the word allegedly, because, um, sorry, uh, although for a while there, the peppered moth um, uh, paradigm was um, uh, under challenge uh, as supposedly not shown. Well, Majerus, before he died, who was one of the major figures in that area, plugged that hole quite nicely. And so we've got that, ah, hello, huge red flag and half a football field length offside. Yes, Festa. Yes, we are... Um, so that um, uh, section is, uh, they're, they're now climbing up to over 50% of the sources in Sarfati and Tay's book are from creationists. And um, it's going to be funky to see whether that variation is going to change. I've never really encountered a pseudo-technical work uh, of this type in the creationist literature that was so heavily weighted on just repeating what they believe and doing in-house sources. I mean, Jensen and... Sanford do better than that. 
in their own way running the risk when you're uh, uh, de delving into so much technical literature, then you run the risk of um, misrepresenting the sources more obviously. So maybe just repeating the mantra will be something more comforting to them. Now, the main event on this episode uh, came from our dear uh, geologist, Buddy Colton, who was on our gang that went down to uh, the Grand Canyon a couple of years ago. And he brought to our attention a dandy example of Emil Silvestru from 2010 at creation.com. Same old CMI that Silvestri, uh, that um, um, Sarfati and uh, Tay come from, uh, which is misrepresenting the content of the sources. This is nice, good old fashioned uh, head up your ass, Dwayne Gish um, and uh, um, Andrew Snelling level misrepresentation. Um, several of the links, I'll be putting the link up to uh, to the creation.com piece. It's on the Canadian oil sands. The Canadian oil sands, a different story. I hadn't encountered this previously, which means that it hasn't been pushed by um, any of the recent uh, apologetics. See, I get a little posting from CMI and um, uh, they are often retreading older material, uh, sometimes very old, some of the um, uh, David Minton material from the 1990s even. They typically don't go too much farther back than because the CMI only goes back so far, at which point you're blumping into the fact that they were actually Answers in Genesis at that stage. But the thing is <clears throat> that um, the relevant one for Colton's point was this 2004 paper from Gingras which I will be putting the link up to that as well, so you don't have to take our uh, words for anything. Uh, and another one from 2022 by uh, Zhang uh, that um, relates to a follow-up work. So he's doing the two bits. First of all is the fact that um, it's a debate over whether or not the deposit that Silvestru is riffing off of is formed in an estuary. And... Um, our little guy is insisting that that model is wrong, that it's flood, big slosh. I mean, that kind of goes without saying. But he cites the Gingrich work to imply that there's been doubts raised about the estuary model. And what Colton, his little radar went off, uh, that, wow, that didn't sound very plausible. And in the original paper, that's because it didn't say that made no indication that anyone was down in the estuary model. There was just some little sidebar references that Silvestri takes out of context uh, to give the impression that the paper says something that it doesn't. That's a bad dog thing. Uh, and uh, Colton brought in then the 2022 Zhang paper uh, to show that the estuary model hasn't gone away and nobody in the regular geological community is, is uh, uh, thinking about this. In fact, the irony is about these Canadian oil shales is that this is one of the most meticulously studied area because it's oil shale, so it's uh, economic of interest to do so. And people have been drilling holes into this bloody thing and therefore bringing up core samples uh, all over the place. So it's got just a vast amount of data field that are going into the construction of all of this. And I was naturally impressed with the fact that we've got Silvestru plopped down on the misrepresenting source department, but I was kind of intrigued about the rest of his argument, which, uh, to, uh, because this is a full source analysis. So what intrigued me was the stuff that he goes into on uh, these uh, ichno fossils. See, in the shales, they've got a bunch of these little burrows and things, little spiral burrows no example of what the animal was that did it. And there's quite a extensive literature about working that out. And the point is the reason why they're regarded as to be in an estuarial setting is because that's what the rocks indicate and nothing to do with the burrow part. And the, the, that's reinforced by the idea that the kind of critters that make burrows something like that today live in an estuary environment to boot. And so uh, I had nothing on this particular deposit, nor on any of the ichno fossils uh, involved when I went into this cold. I was just looking up because um, Silvestru had name dropped uh, several examples of uh, critters that he was ripping off of. Uh, the little section where he's talking about the paleo environment, 
Uh, so how can someone positively deduce that certain tubular features like gyrolithes, uh, cylindricness, uh, scolithos, uh, arenicolites, and planolites found in the MMF, which is the uh, abbreviated name for this deposit, the McMurray Formation, are indeed ignites of unknown creatures that are brackish water dwellers. They could have been produced in any watery environment. Really? You'll note at the point where that happens, he's not offering any sources for it. Uh, the closest he's going into. Hi, Gregory. Um, the uh, he's busy. Um, uh, he, he cites uh, for uh, the source citation on um, this ichno fossils. Uh, guess who? Uh, more Silvestru. So he's just repeating his own mantras. Well, I didn't have any information on any of those taxa, and so I started looking into them. And holy smokes, I found a lot. I mean, there is in that if you look at the uh, uh, the papers. In fact, I found so many papers on this subject that I probably won't be able to put links into all of them because I'll run out of the limit that you have. It's like five thousand characters uh, for uh, the the message, but I'll put in the most recent ones and work my way back on it. And so each one of these things has meticulously gone through and taxonomized because some of them have variations from one deposit to the next. They're looking into a great detail. Uh, about um, the uh, um, the geological context of the of the things where they are. Some of them are looking into modern analogs of these creatures. Uh, they're usually like uh, worms and various other. Some of them are, uh, are more likely to be um, uh, little gastropods and and uh, various stuff. Uh, and it was a really quite a fascinating topic uh, that I wasn't anticipating was going to have just all this mass, given the fact that they're systematizing a thing for which they don't have the actual fossil of what made the burrows. And needless to say, when you get these various papers up there, the, um, the oldest of which was from 1995, uh, I may not be able to get those in there, uh, this uh, Thalassinoides and the Enigma of Early Paleozoic, um, then there's Modern Analog for the Trace Fossils, Gyrolithes, I'll probably want to make sure that one's in there, uh, and um, multi-purpose burrows um, and uh, things on Halloween, estuary incised valley deposits, uh, uh, Mycenaean cis-elastic platform. And so all of these things are um, relating it to the local geologic context and the bigger geologic context. You can compare that array with the vague nothing <laughs> that's in Silvestro. And so maybe that's a reason why uh, a CMI hasn't waved at it uh, in the 13 years since it came out because not a hell of a lot there uh, for them to play around with. Um, and also that he hasn't really done anything to do a follow-up on. There's a certain hit-and-run nature to an awful lot of creationism that I find very, very revealing. And that often pops up when you find an older creationist source because then you can look to see, well, have they done anything since? Needless to say, the regular scientists have sure as hell done a hell of a lot since. And uh, um, I'm not sure yet exactly where I'll be sliding this material. I, I, it's, it's such an interesting topic that I'm going to want to include it in the new um, rocks where there somewhere. But whether or not it'll be in the geologic time frame uh, involved or in some other context, I'll, uh, I'll find out what, uh, where that works out, but it's just too juicy a bit. Plus it's the discussion of how Silvestro is misrepresented a source. Uh, joining the Andrew Snelling club. Um, oh yeah. It was solid rock even back over 30 years when I first got involved in the oil sector industry. Exactly. And that was what struck Colton uh, about this is that this attempt by Silvestro to give the impression that the estuary of a model for these kinds of deposits was wrong, um, fly, flew against the available data uh, and also was hinging, I think, upon the fact that how many creationists reading this sort of stuff would never think to do the follow-up research, would never even bother to look up the original material. But had they looked up the original Gingras paper, which calls Colton, with the bug of the uh, methodologist in him, uh, does exactly that. So this is an important lesson that I've learned over the years and, and other people have learned also. Never take a pseudoscience ideologue source citations at face value. That in fact, the odds are the more confidently they offer a source to say, to indicate a really incendiary point that supports their argument, 
greater the odds are that it's doing exactly the opposite. And looking up the original paper will actually only reinforce that. That's how you can locate examples of misrepresentation of source material. Um, it's a different kettle of fish, obviously, if you are fantastically versed in the field where your eyeballs are ready to jump on things that are eccentric, such as that estuary matter, to where you're going, oh, this is the context for this. And you're going, eh, I don't know about that. And it, there's nothing magical about this. Uh, it's the process that you use in any venue. Uh, it can be something as trivial. I was watching an old, um, quite a few years ago, I, I'm a regular viewer of uh, Antiques Roadshow. And uh, at one point, somebody had brought up a lithograph um, of a uh, car um, with a tail fins and in a kind of deserty environment, as I recall. And the and, and it was appraised and it was a genuine thing. And so they put an X number of value on it. But the intriguing thing about it was that of when they dated it, that the appraiser uh, put it at like mid 1955. Well, my jaw was dropping because the car is a 1959 Buick. <laughs> so it can't possibly be earlier than that because that's when the car came out. It would have to be 59, 60, 61 if they're picking a fairly recent example of it. Um, there was another uh, bit this popped up when um, uh, somebody apparently uh, was complaining about um, how uh, innocent and wonderful and low price everything was back in the good old days of the 1980s. Uh, but they put a picture up from a street scene that was really obviously not, not the 1980s. It was the 1950s. And in fact, that was one where I was looking at the cars uh, to see how many headlights any of the cars had. And if no double-headed headlights, and given the fact that in those days, turnover of automobiles was much, much greater, so that the typical advantage that it, in an average street scene where there's an awful lot of cars, the picture is probably taken not too many years after the most recent car. So I guesstimated it probably 1957 because there were no dual-headed headlights. Uh, only a few cars were coming out with dual headlights uh, in 57. Um, and uh, uh, most of the cars seem to be more 55, uh, 56, 54 range. So a uh, 57 bet was pretty nice and easy. And so you can do all that kind of thing in, in virtually any context to see that something doesn't look right for the period. Um, I kind of had that sensibility anyway because I do historical novels. Boom, boom. So I pay attention to um, uh, the little details of things uh, in a way that is, would probably drive some people nuts. And anybody who does historical research will have that kind of an eye on that. So the, the principles that you're looking at in terms of source analysis uh, and um, uh, serious documentation for stuff is not restricted to the sciences. It's everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Uh, and um, then the other lesson that, that pops up, uh, and I've had to dust off aspects of it with the new Speaker of the House because... Uh, information has been pouring in about that guy that uh, he is a full out Answers in Genesis style Ken Ham Young Earth creationist. He's lecturing. He's, he has his posts up on there. He's going to be with a meeting at his wife with his wife on uh, defending motherhood uh, uh, from the ravages of secularism uh, next year. Although being Speaker of the House, <clears throat> maybe he won't be showing up. I don't know. We'll find out whether or not he, that actually ends up doing that. But he practically ticked off the whole litany. Obviously, the anti-abortion issue, which is a de rigueur for the conservative Trumpista base. But uh, he's a climate science denier. He was an election denier. Um, apparently skeptical of some of the COVID thing as well. So he's just ticking off. He's apparently personally uh, a, a very self-effacing, pleasant fellow. Um, and so he's kept kind of a low person on the radar. But in terms of the ideology, uh, wow, we're going to find out what's going to happen here as Speaker of the House. Uh, it'll be interesting to see whether or not he uh, lets bills come up for vote where there'll be a lot of things that can be um, uh, voted on, where there's probably a majority of the House still to vote for Ukraine aid. They're apparently going to split it up with that and the uh, Israeli aid, unlike the $110 billion package that uh, Biden wanted, where this would be put together with some homeland security issues and all of that. Um, we'll find out what the circumstances are as to who votes for what. Marjorie Taylor Greene and the like, they'll have one little bits on that. 
But so long as bills at least come up for a vote, that'd be one thing. The problem with an ideologue uh, as speaker is that they can prevent things from actually coming to a vote at all. And if that's the case, that can produce a mess. Uh, or they're trying to use uh, votes as a leverage to get concessions on other areas. And of course, uh, um, being a Trumpista conservative, um, uh, Mike Johnson is all for uh, cutting spending on presumably things other than the Defense Department. Uh, but never, 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 never wanting to raise tax on rich people. And as somebody who could remember back as the tax, tax rate has fluctuated over the years, why the low tax rates that we have on people at the top is really dumb uh, and help fuel the deficits, I keep on trying to probe on that point. Uh, and so when I bump into uh, politicians like Johnson, although he's kept a low profile, I haven't seen him popping up on the Twitter feed and all that much yet. Uh, and he may be keeping a lower profile because of so much uh, um, heat that's been coming in on it. Um, but the various other acolytes in this area, uh, I want to have sources. And um, just like Donald Trump uh, just uh, spewed out a thing about um, uh, that the price of gasoline in California is $8 and something cents. And um, nope. <laughs> I looked at the AAA website. It's more like $5.13, something like that. So uh, as usual, the exaggerator Trump was just escalating things by 50%. Um, <clears throat> yes, we need a, we, the U.S. government needs a, an update to modern times very desperately. We're uh, uh, an awful lot of it. We, well, and, and not even modern times. We need, we need that, that progressive uh, trust buster attitude that we had uh, in 1905 and 1910. Uh, boy, that's uh, uh, hard to find. Certainly not among Republicans. You can find a little bit of it among Democrats, but not among Republicans. And so, uh, and the fact that so many of the people um, in the uh, political realm today are too young to remember much of the past and too ignorant to look into it. Um, I think Johnson has uh, praised uh, David Barton the pseudo historian, that's the worldview that he comes from. So his universe is much smaller. It's only 6,000 years old and it's all Christian America and it's all of that. And, and so he can be completely sincere in his belief um, in the same way that Silvestru is sincere in his belief, but how much of what's going on in the political realm will be on the same scale of data suppression or manipulation or what is much more likely is that Johnson is functioning like a secondary copyist who is relying on other people to misrepresent the information for them. And they simply swallow that hook, line, and sinker. Uh, I've seen no indication whatsoever that uh, Johnson does any fact-checking of his material. He doesn't offer sources for stuff. And I, I'm not sure whether he knows any sources on any of this stuff. Um, he's vague and, and ideological, even in the few posts that have popped up that he does. Basically, he was opposed to gay marriage and that sort of thing. Uh, so although the ideology is completely expected, the methodology provisionally, I would put him below the Silvestru level as somebody who's simply copying other people's ideology and never fact-checking any of it. I think we're reaching the stage in our political environment where one of the revolutions that we need is to force um, um, a documentation level on the part of politicians. Now, asking pesky questions of Johnson got booze from his little clack uh, when he, they, he was being asked about uh, his election denialism. And uh, that's uh, an authoritarian approach to things. And as somebody that can remember when Republicans were actually Republicans, Ed can know the history of all the way back to Lincoln and all the other things about how tyrannies work and how uh, free societies operate. Uh, that ain't cutting it. I don't like that at all. Um, he's having an update towards a, a proper democracy. Yeah. Uh, so sound information is absolutely critical on that front. Now, the problem is, is, be, is that one of the things that we're bumping off of is that we're having increasingly sectarian compartmentalization of our information networks. So the kind of person who is a giddy Trumpista who thinks he walks on water is that they will never bump into any information to the contrary. 
in the same way that a doctrinal creationist can spend all of their world finding out about things via the um, uh, propaganda network. And if they never fact check any of it, what happens when they bump into external information that conflicts with the dogma? Well, it's just false. Not true. In the same way that that creationist uh, kid over in Idaho uh, just couldn't wrap his head around the idea that there were feathered dinosaurs and wouldn't look at the information that was made available to him free. And yet, nope, give it back. I'm not going to look at that. And so that kind of mindset has always been there. I don't think uh, that the uh, Trump demographic in particular has popped out of the woodwork poof all on its own. No, those minds were already there. Some of the uh, Trump supporters voted for Obama. Um, you know, there are, are um, uh, black conservatives who uh, uh, would be in favor of Obama as the first black president and then feel disillusioned because he didn't do the things he wanted and end up becoming Trumpistas. That, 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 that has happened. So you have an interesting flux going on. But I guarantee you on all fronts, we have exactly the same situation with the um, a mess that's going on in the Middle East where you've got polarized camps uh, who are extremely supportive of Israel on the one side or extremely supportive of the Palestinians on the other and operate in completely independent frames to where information which may or may not be real is funneling in from various uh, circumstances. There was apparently um, a video that went around about um, uh, a big rally in France uh, for the Palestinians. Well, it wasn't about the Palestinians. It was a soccer match, and it was in Brazil, and it <laughs> that uh, uh, it, it didn't have anything to do with that. But somebody was presenting it as if it had come from there. And so the major rule that you have to follow is, regardless of which side you're on, do not take information that's just popping on you, especially on uh, Elon Musk's all breaks are off Twitter or any of the other Facebooks or any of the other social media. Wait till the dust settles. And my one of my litmus tests would be if uh, public radio and BBC aren't reporting on it, it probably ain't real. Uh, and uh, so you would have to be using that as a vetting element. And you can do elements of your own vetting of material that comes in, if you can get a paper trail, is to do fact-checking and cross-checking on things. Find out, you know, are, are they an ideological source? Uh, are they simply repeating uh, secondary stuff? Now, there are people who are more diligent in researching how propaganda misinformation hits. Well, yeah, the BBC, they've, they've had their ups and downs over the years, but they're still, uh, generally speaking, uh, um, uh, pretty reliable. Uh, in uh, most of their um, uh, reportage. Uh, if anything, they tend to be tiptoey on certain issues, especially in relationship to their own British regime. But nevertheless, um, uh, they, they do try to fact check stuff uh, at various levels. And so uh, another factor is don't rely on a single source. Uh, so, which I don't. So I'm getting material from a wide variety of areas and bringing up stuff. There tends to be a certain ghettoization of stuff to where certain things will be highlighted in certain media contexts and other things won't. And uh, in the fog of stuff where you're waiting to see how dust is going to settle, uh, I'm used to that in the historical and the scientific frame because people come out with the press release about the important thing and you have to wait until can, people can get a look at it. So, well, um, oh, well, I hadn't heard that part about the BBC propaganda outlet for the Johnson as Trumpista party these days. Uh, that I haven't seen an indication on. I'll be keeping that in my mind as to whether or not that's um, an accurate reflection of stuff. Part of the problem, in the, and this covers all the different media outlets, is that a great deal of it is to be dispassionate and they want to talk about the policies people have, but very, very, very little is done in the way of source analysis. And I would think that that's a revolution that I definitely want to see happen. And I'm not sure that it's ever going to happen where reporters are routinely asking people for their sources rather than just simply what their policy positions are. And that means a lot of stuff has to be done preemptively on research. Um, 
Well, yeah, Al Jazeera is a, is an interesting mixed bag because they have a, a lot of range of people. Some of it in terms of their their funding, there there's there's people they um, have to kowtow to, and and others. Others we can argue are right off the bat unreliable. So anything that is running coming out of the of the PRC in terms of their official media, uh, or um, uh, take the opposite extreme, the anti. Uh, Chinese communist uh, bunch at Epoch Times. They're also equally unreliable uh, as a source base because they're highly ideological. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the stealth bit uh, of where um, um, players like in Putin's Russia are sprinkling little things and underneath the radar uh, to foment disorder and disorganization and, and uh, uh, polarization. And so it makes it way tougher to sort all this material out and to keep a, head, uh, a steady thing on it. I personally have my own policies on things. Uh, uh, and so I can look to see whether or not we're getting closer to that or not. Uh, the Middle East it, it has been intractable all, in my, all through my lifetime. And so long as you have uh, partisan elements where it's basically whose grievance you're going after, uh, and whose bombs you're going to lob over there and whose bombers are going to come back over and blow things up. Um, they've got to completely change their dynamic. Uh, and uh, it can theoretically be done. I would wager most Israelis and most Palestinians can live peacefully with one another. But in the circumstance of how everything connects up with all of the interest groups and the like, boy, it's hard to get down to that uh, range. So Hasn't been resolved in my lifetime, but I'd like to see it resolved in my lifetime. If I were a emperor, um, you, know, you could just move everybody out and vaporize the whole uh, Middle East and extend the Mediterranean Sea, and they won't have to worry about fighting over who owns Jerusalem anymore. But that would be rather draconian, and I don't have the power to do that. Um, <clears throat> 22 USA has dropped four spots. Yes. Yeah, well, there's um, it's a complex mix. Um, about uh, what goes on in a country, especially if it still has a pluralist structure. You can have authoritarian elements going on in certain areas. The, pil the politicization of the Supreme Court has been very serious. Uh, and the uh, we're going to be grappling with the problems of not just the people on the Supreme Court, the Trumpista Supreme Court, but also the various Trumpista people that were put in so many of the positions at the... Uh, um, circuit court level. Uh, it wasn't a, a full mix. They don't have complete control over things, but nevertheless, there's an awful lot going around in there. And we're going to be grappling with that for the next 30 or 40 years, because some of these are young enough in lifetime positions that they're going to be making a mess for quite a while. So fasten your seatbelts, kids. It's going to be interesting. Um, hopefully I will live long enough to finish my books and not see the Republic collapse and uh, get back more onto the steady trail of, of, of uh, exploring the universe and doing neat things and uh, diverting resources from blowing each other up to resolving problems on the planet and investigating elsewhere. Um, oh, well, that's not a very nice, yeah, that indeed is a disturbing thought if uh, Boris Johnson and uh, Nigel Farage have become uh, uh, news anchors uh, on there. That That's a bit of where you're trying to have balance in the same way that uh, sometimes some hyper conservatives are put on um, as uh, balance on what is otherwise a fairly liberal news media bit. Um, but all underlying it all is the issue about sound method. Reporters have to follow sound method as well. I don't give a rat's ass about uh, per se, what your political persuasion is. If your method is ill-grounded, uh, it doesn't matter what your political position is. You're going to come up with unreliable answers most of the time. You'll be looking at everything from a political perspective, and you don't let the chips fall where they may first before you make policy decisions. Um, and uh, that's why I've gone over a mutation in my lifetime as to whether or not I would I was a Republican uh, voter tending. Uh, I've always technically been an independent, um, but um, the political parties were switching their dynamics to the point where Democrats started looking more like the kind of policies that I approved of anyway, and Republicans started looking less that way. And then when Republicans uh, got to be so pathologically anti-science, although there are elements in the Democratic Party 
uh, that have those serious problems too. I mean, after all, Robert Kennedy Jr. Uh, with his anti-vax lunacy uh, is on the Democratic Party. Most all of his policies are fairly conventional left wing, but on that one, whoop, he jumps off the um, uh, the uh, the, uh, the boat, and and that's part of the reason why trying to identify whether or not politicians have Tortukan style minds or not is so important. Because if you have a Tortukan mind, a mind shell mind that just doesn't pay any attention to things that conflict with a, a, a belief that will be believed in irregardless of what the facts are, um, even if you have a lot of decent policies in one area, you can just fall off the rails on another. Uh, I think that was a, a, a serious problem with Woodrow Wilson, who had so many progressive reformist uh, instincts and was a blatant Southern racist who instituted segregation uh, um, principles uh, when he became president of the United States. So you need to know more and more about not merely what their political position is, but also their source methodology. And you could argue that that same kind of doctrinal dogmatism mind that uh, Wilson had um, got us into an, rather an authoritarian slant when he became uh, when we got into World War One, and uh, so many of the things with the Palmer raids and the thing that greased the, the wheels for the Republicans of the 1920s uh, was begun under Wilson. So things are complicated, and uh, uh, the, yeah, the Democratic Party, the left wing. Well, um, uh, the um, the United States always uh, for a long time had largely centrist parties where the more liberal ones were tended to be on the democratic side, but you still had liberal Republicans. And then you also had some con conservatives being tending, uh, particularly business style conservatives, tending to belong to the Republican party. Uh, although you had for a very long time, the Ku Klux Klan racist branch of the Democrats um, uh, dominating things so intensely. Now, party configurations and demographics switch over time. Um, there was a move towards the deaf, true center uh, in the Clinton years, for example, uh, um, after uh, uh, McGovern lost so spectacularly against Nixon uh, in 72. And that's one of the reasons that I slid over to start voting for Clinton and, and that during that period, I kind of wanted to encourage that process of pulling into the center. Uh, the problem with the Republican Party is that they just devoured their left wing and their middle wing to the point of where what passes as a moderate Republican would have been a very conservative Republican back 40, 50 years ago. And the very conservatives of today wouldn't be welcome in the party at all. Uh, the William Buckley types would probably have read them out. And you had a whole network of, of balance, counterbalance things that wasn't completely um, impervious to extremism. After all, Goldwater was the candidate in 1964. Um, but it's it, there were more breaks in place in that party structure where there was still a, a great deal of backroom maneuvering and the like. And of course, it went out of control when, with, in the Democrats in 68 as they just fissioned back and forth with uh, over uh, uh, the war that acts as a divisive feature, which reminds us if there is an intensely divisive thing going on, no amount of political institutions are going to be immune to being disrupted by that. So the argument should be not to have disruptive things like that. Don't get into circumstances where you have really disastrously bad wars. On a big global scale, what worries me is we want to make sure that the kind of policies that are instituted not in just in the United States, but all over the place, prevent there being a, a global depression. Because we know what happened the last time uh, authoritarian local regimes then got a global depression going. That's the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and that did not turn out well. So we want to avoid that because the consequences of that, slowing down international trade and having uh, depressions, that's where extremists just go hog wild and pulls too many brakes off. So am I apprehensive about the next 20, 30 years? Yeah. Am I completely depressed? No, because there's an, a lot of stuff going on. Part of it involves the free flow of information. And so to the extent that nations still have access to information 
and alternate voices on things rather than just having tunnel vision and certainly not state controlled media. That's a dead giveaway that you're in trouble the moment you have state controlled media because now uh, you're only getting the one view of things and people turning on their television sets, um, high definition TVs in Russia that are getting just the one propaganda line. It's not as though people don't pay attention to stuff outside of that, but they have to be very surreptitious about it. And it's much harder in the same way that the decades of, of control in the Iranian regime hasn't caused them to be any more popular with the population. And so you get big riots in the streets over uh, the oppression that they've done. Uh, of course, the Iranian regime is still there and still being a nuisance. So how all that's going to be pulling out and resolving is something that, um, younger he heads than me are going to have to contend with. That's uh, that's the world that you youngins out there are going to have to be dealing with. Um, well, economic depressions are an element of bad policy. Oh, uh, you could argue that the Soviet Union and that had a permanent depression going automatically. They, they had, the, the, the Soviet Union operated like the world's largest company town. Uh, cap all the worst features of capitalism entrenched and gulags on top of that. Um, the Great Depression came about from a variety of independent bad decisions made by a bunch of different things all at once. And had even half of those not happened, we might never have had a global depression. And it involved everything from Montague Norman at the Bank of England trying to maintain the $5 in gold pound when it was not economically feasible to pull that off. You had the French uh, anxious to pull every dime out of Germany uh, in reparations. You had the Germans being having uh, money pulled out of them because of the reparations. And in fact, I think the Stresemann government actually took the attitude that, that um, yeah, we'll squeeze the, the, the German people and make us all miserable and that people will finally feel sorry for us and stop the the reparation payments. Well, that didn't turn out to be the way either. Uh, so there was just a mess of bad decisions. And then when the depression hit in the United States, uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, the original founder of it had died. And you had a bunch of people in there that were piling up all this gold that was coming in from Britain because of their Montague Norman stupid policy. And um, uh, they were going to save it up for the rainy day. Um, it, it exceeded everybody's load parameters. Uh, an awful lot of, of, of top-down uh, amelioration efforts were begun under Hoover when the, when the Depression hit. Um, I think the Reconstruction Finance Organization and a few other things were actually Hoover policies, but it was all top-down to help the banks and the businesses, not to help people at, from the bottom up. And that ultimately didn't work out very well, and the Republican Party simply didn't have the imagination to think outside the box in the way that largely fiscally conservative FDR was, uh, who um, um, had who tacked right or left depending on the circumstances. You know, he thought he could, he would wanted to have a balanced budget. Uh, 1936, he uh, tried to get back into that line and that a little minor recession came in. So he had to pull off of that, you know, because he was a very practical kind of a politician. He said, look, I want to see what works. Um, <clears throat> so all of this stuff that, that, economic policies at lots of different levels that are affecting a lot of different countries. Now we have the added value of problems that we have to be gear shifting into uh, a, uh, a, a carbon neutral world, which is if done intelligently and with the right incentives and structures at the legislative and regulate, regulatory level can actually be a tremendous boon for capitalist industry as people are meeting the market needs of these new technologies. We've also got issues to deal with in terms of uh, supply chains with countries that are authoritarian. The Chinese want to have a lock on an awful lot of these uh, things and they've been building up trade networks in Asia and, and big uh, their uh, railroad belts, uh, communication things and trade networks and that, which I think in the long run won't serve them well because the Chinese will just annoy everybody as the new imperialists. So, but that's over the course of the rest of the century. We'll see how all that stuff works out. Um, it's fun to play out some of these little scenarios in the head if you're doing any science fiction stories. Um, I have a little story that I had worked on way back in the 1960s, 70s and 80s about an interstellar expedition. It was actually set in the 2020s and I'm now in the 2020s and bits and pieces of my 
projection were pretty accurate and others, uh, the, the technology, frankly, is not nearly as advanced as the original story about the climate deniers in shot. Well, yeah, that, that's a legitimate issue to deal with, that it's, it's a complex factor. One, part of the difficulty is that, like say, if you look at a Kansas, there's an awful lot of a climate deniers officially in the Republican Party in Kansas. At the same time, they know by observation that things are getting really bad for a lot of the farmers in the part of the state. And the same thing is for sections of Texas. You have to, you know, Texas for oil country and piled up of conservative politicians and nincompoops like Cruz. At the same time, it's one of the biggest states for wind power and that. So, I mean, there, there's a lot funky going on. Uh, all the fuss and bother that was over gas for, uh, gas stoves in Florida uh, that they were uh, making screaming bloody murder about. Did they not look at the statistics? 90% of the ranges in Florida homes are electric already. <laughs> so it's, it you know, that, that uh, people get all inflamed about this stuff, but eventually you start bumping into things. And um, uh, reality is a very hard thing to deal with. The, the, the issues of sound policy. One of the things that's important to see what's going to be happening in the new Congress is um, the fact that the forward-looking uh, environmental programs that were instituted under Biden, they haven't gotten rid of them. Uh, Biden and company maneuvered around uh, uh, the Speaker of the House when there were severe talks about gutting a lot of these programs, and they didn't. So uh, that, that, that got played extremely well. Um, even though he's an old guy, older than I am, uh, Biden knows how the game is played. And there are people in, I'm sure, even though she's playing low key compared to uh, uh, Hakeem Jeffries, who's the public face of the Democratic Party, uh, Nancy Pelosi is still in the Congress. And I'm sure a lot of behind the scenes maneuvering and vote counting and stuff are going on to see procedurally how they can maneuver along on stuff. But the, the infrastructure program and the uh, inflation reduction environmentalism uh, is pretty much all still in place. And it's going to be playing out over the next five and 10 years, even past the uh, whatever is the next administration in 2024. Um, and if that stuff can have a chance to play out, then we're going to be seeing directly what kind of effects there are on things. Um, the, the recession that was being constantly predicted uh, hasn't happened. Uh, unemployment stayed extremely low. Interest rates are higher than they were, and inflation is slightly higher than the Federal Reserve would like. But compared to the stagflation that I knew of in the 1970s that got way out of hand and had to have a really serious recession to end it, uh, that, that isn't going on. So you've got some fairly level heads on things, uh, and you've got a lot of stuff moving in, in, in the right direction. Um, just from a sheer, and of course, this wasn't done by magic. This was done by a, a lot of legislative prods. But um, I've, uh, somebody put a picture up on the on Twitter just a bit ago. Um, uh, uh, they were commenting on a picture that was put up by um, someone who put up a, a picture of an old um, pickup truck uh, and uh, old 1980s, maybe 1990s, and a current one, which was much bigger model, same model. Thing, how much larger and all that are. And yet, I think if you looked at the details, you discover that the modern truck has better gas mileage than the old one does, just as modern cars have better gas mileage than the old one does. Uh, I, I drive a little 2013 Honda Civic Hybrid. It's a 10-year-old car, and yet still running fine. You, you wouldn't you'd be surprised that it's not a brand new car. It's because everything is durable and efficient and comfortable. And I think back to what cars were when I was growing up, that by any practical status uh, uh, use of the term, my Honda Civic hybrid is a luxury sports car. It would have been classed as a luxury sports car in 1965 and 75 and 85. I mean, it's a luxury car. It's got power windows and, and, and power door locks and automatic headlights and stuff. Uh, and it's a sports car. It's got bucket seats, um, shift on the floor, tachometer, zero to 60 in 10.5 seconds, which was remarkably good time uh, for that range. It wouldn't classify as a luxury sports car now, 
because our definitions of what's luxury and what sport has changed. But I look at it from that uh, context. So I have a vehicle now that gets twice the gas mileage of the old four-cylinder Alero that re it replaced. So my energy footprint is cut in half. And if you have more and more bits to where you keep the economy in such a way that people are, are in fact getting newer vehicles, phasing out their older models and all that, um, there will be some bumpy things going as the... Um, we say bye-bye to local gas stations, which uh, in 20 or 30 years, why would you have a local gas station when everybody's charging up their cars in their garage or where they work? Why would you need a gas station? There will be still some gas stations and the legacy ice engine people who will still be able to drive their old gas guzzler. And by gas guzzler, they probably get 30 miles per the gallon on them. In other words, they're not like a car from 1965 or 1955 would have been gas guzzler, single digit kind of mileage, um, but they'll be paying through the teeth for their gas. And some of them, however, will go to a retrofit thing and they'll have their car that they love the shape and the interior of, and they'll have an electric engine put in. Things like that will happen in the same way that we went from horse and buggy and trolley cars and, uh, and walking uh, to a, a world of automobiles, and it took decades to make that transition. It didn't all happen all at once. So there's part of the thing about the historical end of it. Hopefully, I will be living long enough into that period past my, if I live to past 100th birthday, that'd be after 2052, uh, and we'll see where things are on there because a lot of the circumstances to see um, how much of Florida is disappearing? Already you have a situation in Florida where, where house insurances are just going through the roof uh, on there because of uh, uh, the uh, climate change issue and litigation issues because insurance companies don't want to have to pay up about stuff. And uh, private uh, self-insuring has had to become a thing down in there and it's a mess. And if there's going to be circumstances where there are a lot of places, barrier islands along the Carolinas. Uh, uh, there's a whole slew of things or farmland in spots that you can't grow crops anymore because you just don't have the water. Uh, it's going to be an interesting world that we're going to be dealing with. It'll be different. We're clever species. Uh, we will. I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for us. Uh, Doctor Who is rooting for us. Yes, his favorite planet. Uh, and uh, we'll see how things all work out on that. So anyway, uh, that was a roller coaster show and up and down. And um, I don't typically dive into political issues, um, even though I'm not reluctant to do so. Um, but it does connect up that hopefully you, uh, you're getting the impression that I'm trying to use the same information database and look at if, if I had to sum up my entire worldview, it's William Jamesian pragmatism uh, that, yeah, you have things that you hold dear as philosophical positions, but you have to look to see what their effects are. And if the effects are going in a good direction, then, OK, hold on to them. Uh, 65 Shelby Cooper. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, well. And, and the thing to do, uh, one of the things that will probably become. Um, eventually an easy option would be uh, to replace it with an electric engine. And you'll have the very same car and it'll probably have faster acceleration and the like. All of that, of course, will depend on as we switch over to the electric grid. And, and at the moment, we're still in the very early stages of efficient batteries. Uh, it still uh, takes long a bit uh, longer to charge up a vehicle than it does to just pump a bunch of gas into a car. Um, some of that may change with some of these newer technologies that are coming along that have much faster battery uh, charging times and also um, much greater range. Already at the top end, if you can afford a $90,000 electric truck, some of those have 500 mile range. And uh, so the technology already exists to do that. It will just be a matter of how that eventually filters into the mass market and changes the dynamic of things. And it will happen in the same way that I am driving a luxury car that isn't classified as a luxury car now, but yet that's become the ubiquitous way automobiles are operating. Yes. Well, yes. And that's a thing that that, that that visceral quality is something that's ingrained in an awful lot of people. What amuses me constantly watching 
uh, Motor Week on PBS, uh, and they've been doing their show since the 1970s, and they celebrated like their 45th anniversary, blah, blah, blah. And they occasionally pay attention to how cars have changed and how their perceptions have changed. But one thing that really amuses me is how they're just hooked on the internal combustion engine bit. And you will literally see in the same program where they will test an electric vehicle, an electric truck, for God's sakes, that has faster acceleration and power than the sports car that they test. And yet they're just oogly boogly enthusiastic over the, wow, I just felt like it's so impressive coming off the line and we're up to that. But it was actually slower than the electric vehicle because in part that feel of the engine noise and all of that's part of that visceral contact of it. In the same way that there is the, uh, uh, for any of us who are train groupies and connect up the dots to Colton uh, because he's also one of the train addicted people. In fact, uh, he inherited my old electric train set that I, when, he, when he was up here uh, that I said, would you like to have that as a souvenir? And, and yes, so it's, it's had found a new home in the land of trains. Uh, and yet, if you think about like trolleys and the like, you know, how people dislike buses compared to trolleys. But if you think about a transport vehicle that needs to move people wherever they need to go and that you can change the route at a drop of a hat, that if, if a new route needs to be done, you don't have to tear up a track and lay new track to run a trolley line down. In other words, the, the trolley is a, a fixed installation mode that is actually not very forgiving. Uh, whereas um, highly safe uh, driverless cars uh, that um, uh, would be able to move people around um, more conveniently than often fixed trolleys. And yet I still love the like the trolley car. There's something exhilarating and delicious riding the cable cars and that, that go up in San Francisco. Uh, I have in my amusement park design, there would be things for trolley lines and that that would be running around in the park that people could ride in and get and functionally get from one place to another. But there, there's an aesthetic and a mood about it that uh, in the same way that watching a live play in person is different than watching the live play broadcast over a film or not a live play. You're seeing a recording of it that you're watching on television. Uh, it's a different thing. And that's how the way it goes. Uh, so all of this stuff will be things that we'll be grappling with as we move into a new world and develop the new technologies and get used to stuff. Now, newer generation, just like there are some people, uh, uh, well, uh, I think James Lovelock, Lovelock, the, the Gaia guy, he can't stand windmills. Oh, he detests windmills. He's, he would rather have an atomic power plant next to him uh, than a, a windmill. Whereas... I love the signs of those giant windmills, They're like huge butterflies wheeling on the horizon because we drive past a lot of them when we're going over to Seattle and that there's quite a few escarpments where the winds are coming in. I find them immensely beautiful. Now, whether I would be annoyed if I were living right next to one going whoosh, whoosh, whoosh all the time, I don't know. Uh, obviously, a windmill put out in the middle of a bay, uh, nobody's living next to that. Uh, and which connects up to how Trump and the, some of these nutballs and that were uh, claiming that the uh, windmills were killing whales and that. And that was yet another example of misinformation and they were misstating uh, what the actual facts are. Um, so the, the newer generation is going to be coming in in the same way that who the hell bothers about a landline telephone anymore or um, who actually still operates a VCR? Aren't you using DVRs off of your um, cable system or the way I do, I have a little DVR attachment uh, to my over-the-air video tuner. And so uh, there's a whole different thing and you get into a new mix. I don't, haven't worn a watch in eons, although I still have a teeny tiny little ghost of a, of, a, uh, of, of a white spot that never seems to go completely away, even though I haven't wa worn a watch in years because that's what the smartphone is for. I got to walk clock on that. Um, so the, you've got a different mix of things. People are going to come in and connect up with new um, uh, air taxis, electric air taxis are going to change the way people travel short distance. Um, somebody that wants to go from Spokane to Seattle 30 years from now, very probably will call an air taxi that will pick them up at their front door and fly them at 200 miles an hour uh, to Seattle and drop them off in, in a landing spot, maybe right in front of the house. 
and no one will think a thing of it because it's just what they do. Uh, and there will be so many different technologies and things, assuming we don't blow each other up or assuming we don't get into a global depression or do kinds of things where we start degenerating into uh, authoritarian regimes, which are generally speaking, not good for progress. Um, there's so much that we can be doing and there's so much yet to explore. There's so much of the solar system to look at. So ways of building better, faster power plants so that we can move around the solar system faster. Uh, and to do so, and, and the major factor is to not bring our political squabbles with us, to maintain an internationalized space where, yes, commerce and business and exploration go on, but nobody owns space. Nobody owns Mars. Nobody owns the moon uh, any more than anyone can own Antarctica. And uh, that's the thing that young people uh, working through legislatures and others have got to try to work this out. And the earlier you work it out in your heads and plan for that, the better. Uh, so that it isn't all taking everybody by surprise. But so there's the optimist in me uh, looking at a future that's actually brighter than we were before. Uh, and so long as we can keep from going into messes like World War II uh, or the Black Death or some of the other gunks that have happened in our history, um, we can keep on going forward. So there we go. Uh, that's the, uh, the big picture uh, stuff. We're past an hour. That's enough. Uh, I'll, I'd be dithering on forever on that. Let me put up my uh, rocks for their uh, ad. Oh, oh, and I forgot, in fact, let me uh, remember to put our, without whom this program could not be quite possible. And that is our patrons. Thank you, every every single one of our colleagues and researchers and assistant researchers and friends and all the legacy patrons who were able to help at one point or another. It makes a difference. And needless to say, the more who can join in and help, even, you know, a buck a month makes a difference. Um, do that, please. So everybody that that's, likes what I do and the material that I do and the books and that, um, every leg up helps. So uh, that's that aspect. Now let me find out put up my little cute ad that um, Peter did for us. He uh, shows it all the time on um, uh, everything Jackson Wheat and uh, does with uh, Peter. Uh, they make a point of showing the ad on that as well. So there is a reason why this goes and you can get this at the old Amazon. <laughs> Uh, very proud of the rocks for there. Volume two is going to be just as jam packed. Oh gosh, this just wonderful. In fact, I was just adding some new material in about um, uh, the, the Golden Crocoduck Awards because uh, James Tour lost out to Matt Powell uh, for the 2023 uh, Crocoduck Award. Uh, Tour was in the running because he was talking about soft tissue. Uh, and uh, but Matt Powell had a trifecta of gobsmacking stupidity that blew him out of the water. So anyway, um, everybody watch out for wooden penguins and stay safe. And we will see you all next week. Ending the stream. <laughs>